Throne and Liberty is the most anticipated MMO releasing in 2023. With the recent director's preview, I felt I finally had enough information about this game to do an everything known video about it. I want to thank Zara from the Guild Nexus for helping me with formatting, organizing, and adding new information in the last few days. Like previous everything known videos I have done for other MMOs, the link to the document is in the video description and is a fully comprehensive source for absolutely everything that is known about Throne and Liberty complete with sources for all of the information presented. So be sure to check out the document and let's get into the details of this game. Throne in Liberty is an NCSoft developed MMO that has been in development for over 10 years. At one point it was called Lineage Eternal and was a top-down MMO similar to Lost Ark. At some point they decided to pivot to a third-person MMO and change the IP to Throne in Liberty, which is the main reason it has been in development for so long. There is another NCSoft game codenamed Project E that shares the same IP and world. That world is called Nafkria. The game is said to be developed on Unreal Engine 4. It is possible they have upgraded to Unreal Engine 5, but I don't have confirmation of that from the developers. The server capacity is said to be 3 to 5,000 per server. The release date is said to be in the first half of 2023. The late 2022 release date was pushed back to find a suitable Western publisher, which is rumored to be Amazon. The game is being developed for both PC and console. An internal playtest happened in August 2022 with 3,000 testers. External playtesting will probably happen soon after a Western publisher is sorted out. For the game's monetization, the developers have said they want the game to minimize the effect of pay-to-win and for the gap between payers and non-payers to be minimal. They have said that the West has become more open to microtransactions, but for an MMO to succeed in the West, aggressive pay-to-win must be avoided. As for character customization, we have seen some brief glimpses of the character creator during videos. Players can only play as humans, which of course limits customization options. There is an AI character creator option where players can upload a picture to customize the character to look like themselves or whatever they want. Player transformations are a big feature in Throne in Liberty and are a pivotal part of traversing the world. Instead of mounts, players will transform into a wolf for faster travel on land. In the air, players can transform into a raven to glide to various locations. Sharks have been seen as aquatic player transformations, and even siege golems are possible player transformations during sieges. These transformations combined with the player grappling skill makes movement and traversal very interesting in this MMO. Throne and Liberty is heavily centered around the open world seamless 3D topography they have built for this world. Surrounding this open world philosophy, the developers have three key pillars. These pillars are the environment, events, and memorials. The event pillar refers to the world environment, including the transformations and grappling needed to traverse the world. It also includes the day-night cycles and the weather systems. The events pillar refers to the in-game events that happen in each zone. These events happen every three hours and last for approximately 20 minutes. One example given of an in-game event is the Wolf Tales event wherein players collect Wolf Tales and turn them in at three different turn-in locations. There is a leaderboard associated with this and all events. In this event, PvP is turned on and players can take the Wolf Tales from players that have not been turned in. The number of Wolf Tales in the inventory is displayed on a player's nameplate. This means players are incentivized to turn in the Tales, but doing so means they are not collecting more Tales. Also, the turn-in vendors reduces the number from 3 down to 1 towards the end of the event, further increasing conflict points towards the end. The final pillar is the memorial events. These are server-wide events that take place on each server. When a server progresses to the next stage of a memorial event, the entire server is progressed to the next stage. There is no phasing of individual players, everyone shares the same game world. The UI in Throne in Liberty is very minimalistic and clean. The player nameplate shows buffs below the bar and debuffs above. Health and mana are confirmed player resources. Stamina is also confirmed to be a resource that works with the grappling skill and presumably other skills such as dodging. As for classes in Throne and Liberty, your class is essentially chosen by your weapon choice. Players can dual wield weapons and can equip two weapon sets and swap between them. Essentially, it is very similar to New World. 
The max number of skills I saw in the gameplay footage was 8 skills on a level 56 player, so with weapon swapping that makes 16 total skills available. It might be higher on a max level character, the highest character level I saw in the videos was 66, so max level is at least a level 70 or higher. Just like New World or Final Fantasy XIV, you can level all weapons on one character if you want, which basically makes all it's not needed. Tanking, healing, and DPS rolls are confirmed. The following weapons have been seen so far. Longbow, Pistol, One-Hand Crossbow, Greatsword, Dual Daggers, Wand, Tome, Staff, Sword and Shield, and Dual Crossbow. For combat, the targeting is Tab Lock-On Style. Melee attacks appear to cleave multiple enemies. Pull abilities are seen in the gameplay trailers. The combat seems to be a hybrid action tab style similar to Guild Wars 2 or what Ashes of Creation is going for. As for the PvE, past NCSoft MMOs relied heavily on PvP and player driven content. In this MMO, the developers stated they want to have a heavy focus on making compelling PvE content and to have a game that fits all playstyles. So PvE is not an afterthought in this game and PvP will still be well represented. The dungeons are said to be open world, and in the latest update PvP is said to be on in these dungeons. The dungeons have multiple levels and players can use grappling or gliding skills to go straight to the last floor of the dungeon if they want. The raid bosses are open world and in the past PvP was said to be on for these bosses. It is not clear if that is still the case. The developers have stated they want to have a compelling story and Throne in Liberty, but they want to make it optional for those that are not into the story. There is little known about the story, but NCSoft did release a website called TL Story Map and TL Play Novel that explained some of the story. The biggest gray area surrounding information about this MMO is in regard to the PvP systems. With the recent director's preview, it was stated that most zones are now safe zones and PvP is not forced. However, in the same video, they also made a reference to PvP potentially being turned on in the open world dungeons. This also heavily contradicts what they have said in the past regarding PvP. So we are very much in wait and see mode to get clarification from the devs what the open PvP systems actually look like. In the past, the PvP Karma system was called Evil Deeds, and it was said this system was active to punish PKers during the day, but was turned off at night. Day cycles last 4 hours, and night cycles last 1 hour in TL. PvP is turned on for certain events, such as the Wolf Tales event, and as I already said, PvP is potentially on for world bosses and dungeons. There is also a giant flying island called Gigantrith that travels around the map like a subway line every few hours. This island was said to have PvP enabled in the past. It appears every few hours and exists for 30 minutes. As for organized group PvP, there are two systems in place. Occupation or Guild Wars and Siege Warfare. Occupation or Guild Wars are a battle over open world objectives that guilds can own. The weather systems such as the rain can affect these areas to make certain paths unpassable during these battles. The objectives that guilds will fight over are called Blessing Stones and Dimension Stones. These two stones together are called Possession Stones. The acquisition of the Possession Stones allows for enhanced guild capabilities and the procurement of necessary raw materials. For Siege Warfare, this is where guilds will fight over large battlefield objectives such as castles. Defenders have the advantage, but as time goes on in the battle, players can transform into a golem destroying the wall or jumping on top of the wall. A golem that carries people to the top of the wall is also available. The victory condition appears to be channeling a throne room for the attackers or the timer running out for the defenders. As for travel and transportation, fast travel appears to be limited. There seems to be an emphasis on players using transformations and the grappling skill to move around the map. Movement around the map is active and not passive. There was one potential teleportation stone seen in the first gameplay trailer, but it is not clear what it is used for. As I have already mentioned, the Flying Island Gigantrith is a method of travel that appears every few hours and allows players to access areas they cannot otherwise access. So it might be heavily contested if PvP is turned on. I have already touched on the day-night cycles and the weather systems a bit. As stated before, daytime lasts 4 hours, night lasts 1 hour. The day-night cycles and weather systems affect a lot of things in the game, such as boss strength and drop tables. It can change what kind of mobs spawn, 
and it can affect player abilities. An example given for day-night affecting skills is a dagger skill called Ghost Step, which increases movement speed at night. Another skill that was said to be affected is another dagger skill called Venom Blood Poison, which has a longer duration during the day, but higher damage at night. As for weather affecting player skills, the two examples shown are wind increasing projectile distance and gliding distance. Another example is the lightning skill hits one target when it is sunny, but hits multiple targets when it is raining. Other things the weather can affect is filling a certain alternate path during castle sieges during rainstorms, or the wind increasing gliding distance enough to allow a player to scale a castle wall. Another very interesting feature of the weather and day-night cycles are that some players can affect these systems via spells that are only accessible to players at the top of various leaderboards. These spells are only usable twice a day and can change the weather or day-night cycle for 10 minutes. These spells could be very useful in Siege or Guild Wars if used at the right time. We have seen brief glimpses of many open world raid bosses in TL. The one we have seen the most is a giant sandworm that is called Queen Blender on the TL Play Novel website. We have also seen a Treant boss, a demon boss, a rock golem boss, an ogre boss, a spider boss, and an undead boss named Kuhul Tevin. Pets and minions are seen in the gameplay trailers, but it is not sure what the purpose of these is yet. The herbalism profession was spotted in the gameplay trailer, and that is the only profession we have seen so far. And that concludes the known information for thrown in liberty. To me, despite the concerns about pay to win since this is an NCSoft title, I am still interested in this MMO. I love the focus on the open world, the multiple PvP options that are available, the lack of instancing and fast travel, the weather and day-night cycle systems are very interesting and are different from what we have seen in many past MMOs. This MMO is trying to do a few things differently, and it is not just another carbon copy WoW clone. That alone makes me interested, even if the monetization ends up ruining it, I will at least get a month or two of enjoyment out of it. No other MMO releasing in 2023 really interests me so far. Of course, I am very interested in Ashes of Creation and the Riot MMO for various reasons, but both are a long ways off still. I am willing to give this game a shot, and will be covering it further in the future. If you liked this video, consider watching my previous Everything Known videos on the Riot MMO and the new Zenimax MMO. And let me know what upcoming MMO you would like to see me do an Everything Known video for next. If you have not yet subscribed, consider doing that as well. And with that, I will see you in the next video.